Kia ora, today we're going to teach you some tips and tricks to help you get excellence in Level 1 Science. Level 1 Science can feel like a crazy subject because you're covering three distinctly different topics all with their own sets of, mostly new, content to get your head around. Luckily, it's possible to ace all of them. Each paper requires slightly different strategies for you to snag those important E8 questions and we're going to take you through the key ones. Not only this, but we'll back up by walking you through some examples of where you can use them. It's important to use the timestamps to skip around this video if there's parts you're especially interested in. For the purposes of this video, we'll assume that you're pretty familiar with the content of the papers, so if you suddenly run into a concept that's unfamiliar to you, we're going to suggest you have a look at the study time walkthrough guides, which are available on our website, as well as watching this. Before we get into specifics, there's a couple of skills that you can hone to upgrade the quality of your answers for all three papers. When you're writing excellence quality answers, it's really important that you have a bit of flow. Linking statements with sentence starters like, as a result of, this results in, in contrast to, and for this reason. It's a great idea to also get your answer structure down packed, and for this you can use an anagram like idea. The I is for identify, the keyword or concept. The D is for define this keyword or concept. The E is for explain how this is relevant to the information given to you in the question. And finally, the A is for analysis. Fully explain and finish off with a decisive answer statement to your question. Normally these will start with therefore or this results in. We'll go into some more detailed steps for each paper, but this is pretty much applicable to all of them. It's great to have a handle on answer structure and it will mean you can feel more confident when it comes to applying the content itself. Let's get into things! The genetics topic tends to be very heavy on not only defining concepts, but also drawing connections between them. In an exam situation, NCA writers pick lovely examples for you to utilise when you're explaining these connections. Sometimes, you might find it difficult to figure out exactly what content a question is implying you need to include in your answer, and that's on purpose. Markers want to see that you can draw those connections without needing to be specifically told that they exist. Luckily, there's a natural process you can use to unpack these sorts of questions. 1. Identify the key concepts that are included in the question. These could include DNA, phenotype or variation. 2. Draw connections between other concepts in genetics. Basically, if you're answering a variation question, you also likely need to consider gamete formation and fertilization. Number three, define everything. Even if you sound like a broken record, make sure it's in the context of the specific question you're being asked. Number four, finish off with a decisive answer statement to your question. Normally, these will start with therefore or this results in. Obviously, to pull this off in the best way possible, it's going to be an amazing asset to you if you know the definitions of your key concepts inside and out. Your exam is almost definitely going to ask you about concepts like these, and this is not a complete list. Check out study time checklists and walkthrough guides for more extensive information. From here, focus on making sure you're able to draw connections between your perfectly understood concepts. For example, if you know DNA is a biological blueprint of base pairs, and a gene is a sequence of base pairs that codes for a trait, DNA and genes must be connected because DNA contains those bases. When you're studying before the exam, mind maps are a super helpful tool to help you visualize those connections. Feeling confident about all those definitions and connections? The next step is using them to answer a big fancy exam question. Here's an example from Level 1 Science. A mutation in a human gene can cause people to be protected from HIV infection. Explain the relationship between DNA, genes, alleles and phenotype using this mutation. In your answer, you should define DNA genes, alleles, phenotype, and mutation. Okay, so step one of our question answering process was to identify the key concepts in the context of this question. The context of this example is infection of the HIV virus, and we would be looking at the concepts of DNA, genes, alleles, phenotype, and mutation. Luckily, you've been provided with everything you need to draw connections between. Next, define everything. 
and draw those connections. Think about why DNA, genes, alleles, phenotypes, and mutation are all relevant to talking about getting infected with HIV. DNA contains all the genetic instructions for an organism. Within DNA, there are sections of base pairs that code for a specific trait called genes. A mutation is a spontaneous change to the base sequence of DNA and can create a new version of a gene. Different versions of a gene are called alleles. In the context of HIV, a mutation results in the physical expression of a new allele, a new phenotype, that is expressed as protection from the HIV virus. Our final step was to end with a decisive answer statement, which could look like, this specific mutation causes a change in the base sequence of the DNA and creates a new allele that is expressed as the phenotype of being protected from the HIV virus. This is where those E grades tend to lie. The difference between merit and excellence level answers is annoyingly small, and that's why we should always round off our answer using the context in order to cross that threshold from merit to excellence. Altogether, we have a fully formed answer. DNA contains all the genetic instructions for an organism. Within DNA, there are sections of base pairs that code for a specific trait called genes. A mutation is a spontaneous change to the base sequence of DNA, and it can create a new version of a gene. Different versions of a gene are called alleles, and in the context of HIV, a mutation results in the physical expression of a new allele, a new phenotype, that is expressed as protection from the HIV virus. This specific mutation causes a change in the base sequence of DNA within a gene and creates a new allele that is expressed as the phenotype of being protected from the HIV virus. You might think this sounds a little bit tedious or repetitive, but that's often the way this paper works. If you sound like you're explaining concepts to someone who has never heard them before, your answer is probably actually super effective. In this example, we defined all the key concepts named and showed we understood connections between them. We also chucked them right into the context of the question with a nice, clear answer statement at the end. All bases covered. When attacking the acids and bases paper, the most important strategy to use is based in understanding the theories and concepts that the question being asked is based off. To an extent, this is similar to the first part of the strategy we just unpacked for the genetic variation paper. However, in acids and bases, you're drawing on less connections between a bunch of concepts and more drawing on the connections between the specific question and the theory behind it. Here's what we mean by this. One, identify the core concepts relevant to the question being addressed. If you're being asked about temperature and rate of reaction, you're going to need to discuss collision theory. Number two, discuss the concept in the context of the question. And number three, answer the question itself, making sure to continue drawing on the core concept the question is evaluating your ability to understand. To be successful at this, it would be very beneficial if you had an understanding of the big overarching concepts of this paper. And these include collision theory, how and why ions form, pH and universal indicator, and balancing equations. Let's get into the nitty gritty and show you how this works inside of answering an actual exam question from level one acids and bases. Calcium reacts with chlorine, forming the ionic compound calcium chloride. Explain the ratio of calcium ions to chloride ions in calcium chloride. In your answer, you should explain how the ratio is related to the charge on ions and the number of electrons gained or lost by each atom as it forms the ionic compound. Step one was to identify the core concepts that relate to the question being asked. In this example, we're working with ionic compounds, which means we're going to want to draw on our knowledge of ionic bonding and electron charges. The key to this question is understanding that ions form because atoms gain or lose electrons in order to complete a full valence shell and be stable. We are also expected to know that ionic compounds have no overall charge. We need to make sure this answer is in the context of calcium and chlorine specifically. Calcium loses two electrons in order to obtain a full valence shell and becomes a Ca2 plus ion. Chlorine only needs to gain one electron to obtain a full valence shell, forming a Cl- ion. 
Now we can discuss more about how this information is related to this question, as they would like us to actually explain why the ratio of calcium ions to chloride ions is as stated. Ionic compounds have no overall charge. In order to achieve this, elements donate or accept electrons from each other to fill their valence electrons and cancel out charges. Because the calcium ion has a two plus charge, it needs to lose two electrons to be stable, and chlorine only needs to accept one electron to fill its valence shell. So there needs to be two chlorine atoms so that they can each accept one of calcium's electrons. And boom, we've explained how the ratio of ions is related to their charges, and we've already talked about how many electrons each atom gains or loses right at the start. We can sum it all up by putting it together with a nice rounding off statement. As a result of this ratio, all atoms in the compound have full valence shells and the ionic compound has no overall charge as required. Sentences like this are once again where you tend to get those excellence grades. Obviously, you need to lay the groundwork first, but after that, it takes a sentence or two for an amazing upgrade. Altogether, this looks like Calcium loses two electrons in order to obtain a full valence shell and becomes a Ca2 plus ion. Chlorine only needs to gain one electron to obtain a full valence shell, forming a Cl minus ion. Ionic compounds have no overall charge. In order to achieve this, elements donate or accept electrons from each other to fill their valence shells and cancel out charges. Because the calcium ion has a two plus charge, it needs to lose two electrons to be stable. Chlorine only needs to accept one electron to fill its valence shell, so there needs to be two chlorine atoms so that they can each accept one of calcium's electrons. As a result of this ratio, all atoms in the compound have full valence shells and the ionic compound has no overall charge as required. Easy peasy. A big takeaway in terms of strategy for this paper is to fall back on that core theory and make sure you're using the correct wording when writing sweeping statements. If you're feeling a little unsure, you can always go back and have a read of the acids and bases walkthrough guide right here on Study Time. Go to studytime.co.nz. When it comes down to it, physics can actually be pretty straightforward. Before you roll your eyes, what we mean is that a lot of the time, we can use the formulas given to us on the formula sheet to unpack, well, pretty much any question that gets thrown at you. That's why it's important to understand which equation to use where inside a nice long written answer. That's where the excellence grades lie, knowing that you've used the correct formula and that you can explain why you end up with a specific answer. You can follow some nice steps, another formula if you will, to make sure you're ticking off every box. Number one, identify what's going on and what physics formula you need to explain. Number two, write out the relevant formula. Number three, use the formula in the context of the question. Number four, answer the question. Even though you get a formula sheet in your exam, it's probably a really good idea to revise them and what they stand for before you're sitting in the test. Remember, pressure and power are both represented by P in the formulas you're given, so you'll need to know which one is which. Also, think about learning laws like conservation of energy and remembering that gravity is always represented by 10 meters per second squared. Once again, if you're feeling out of your depth, refer back to our study time walkthrough guides. Once you're solid on knowing your formulas, focus on making sure you know how they interact. By this we mean, if you're looking at a question using P equals WT, it's important you understand that one, you're calculating power using work and time, and two, that when the given time decreases and the amount of work stays the same, the power is going to increase. Still with us? If you are, that's amazing. We suggest you stick around while we unpack a hefty mechanics question from a past level one mechanics exam using our very own question answering formula that we just let you in on. Explain why the horse's hooves sink further into the sand when the rider gets onto the horse. In your answer, you should consider the pressure applied and the forces acting. Note, there are no calculations necessary. Okay, so what's going on? Well, we can see that the most important aspects of this question to consider are in bold, pressure and forces. 
And therefore, let's look for a formula that can encompass both of these. Lo and behold, the formula for pressure uses force divided by area. Now number two, write out the relevant formula. Before we get to the juicy bits of answering this question, it's best to let the markers know you understand which formula you'd use to discuss what's happening with this horse and rider. Pressure equals force divided by area. Step three is using the formula we've linked the question back to in the context of the question. Here, we're looking at what's happening when a person jumps onto a horse standing on some sand and what that's doing to forces and pressure. When the rider gets onto the horse, its hooves will sink further into the sand because together the rider and the horse have a larger combined mass. This larger mass means the two will have a larger combined weight force, though the rider getting on the horse will not affect the surface area of the horse's hooves in the sand. Now that we're nicely in context, let's finish off by clearly answering the question using your established formula in context. Therefore, if the force has increased but the surface area stays the same, the resulting pressure exerted will be of a larger value. More pressure means the horse will sink further into the sand with the rider on his back. As you may have guessed, there's your excellence. You need that nice linking statement at the end, perfectly putting everything in context and answering your question all at once. All together, this looks like pressure equals force over area. When the rider gets onto the horse, its hooves will sink further into the sand because together, the rider and the horse have a larger combined mass. This larger mass means the two will have a larger combined weight force, though the rider getting on the horse will not affect the surface area of the horse's hooves in the sand. Therefore, if the force has increased but the surface area stays the same, the resulting pressure exerted will be of a larger value. More pressure means the horse's hooves will sink further into the sand with the rider on his back. See, not so bad after all. Knowing these formulas inside and out and how they behave when you increase or decrease them is going to be your greatest asset in terms of mechanics. Use those checklists, walkthrough guides, make your own flashcards, teach your poor mum and dad, and do whatever it takes to get them down packed. You'll be getting E8 in no time. Well, that brings us to a close for now. Level one science is tricky simple because of that massive switch up between topics. And you need to have a good handle on where which strategy is going to be most beneficial for you. You've totally got this in the bag if you keep studying and practicing those past papers. And we're cheering you on from the study time offices. Good luck.